Lecture 3. Identity Theory. Token and Type. Last lecture, we asked a number of hard questions about the mind and its relationship to the brain. One theory about the mind that we considered and discovered was quite problematic was the soul hypothesis. But not only is the soul hypothesis problematic, it also fails to address one of the most difficult questions in philosophy of mind, the hard problem of consciousness. Recall, the hard problem is the question of how brain activity produces mental activity. How is it that mental activity emerges from brain activity? Thus, the hard question assumes that mental activity emerges from the brain and thus is dependent upon it. Since the soul hypothesis denies this by supposing that mental activity exists separately and independently of the brain, it cannot answer this question. Of course, if mental activity was not dependent upon brain activity and did not arise from it, the hard problem wouldn't really be a problem. Our failure to answer that question would not be a concern. But, unfortunately for the soul defender, as we saw last lecture, mental activity is, in fact, dependent upon brain activity, and so the problem remains. Early attempts to develop theories of mind that answered these problems but didn't succumb to the shortcomings of the soul hypothesis probably sound strange to modern ears. Take, for example, logical behaviorism, which was a quite popular theory in the early 20th century. Behaviorism was motivated by a couple of things. First, because the idea that minds existed in a separable substance was so problematic, philosophers were highly motivated to find something in the world that they could point to and say, that is what the mind is. Second, logical positivism was a very popular theory at the time. Logical positivism suggested that anything that could be true must be able to be verified, and that the meaning of a proposition literally is the method by which you would verify whether or not the proposition is true. Since a person's behavior was something in the world by which you could tell what mental state a person was in, logical behaviorists suggested that what it meant to say that someone was in a mental state was just that they were predisposed to behave in a certain kind of way. Mental states were thought of as behavioral dispositions, the tendency to respond to certain stimuli in certain ways. All you have to do to verify that someone is in a certain mental state is to expose them to stimuli and see how they react. This theory was better than the soul hypothesis. It was simpler, it literally had fewer substances in it. It was also not subject to the problem of downwards causation but it very quickly succumbed to multiple objections. First of all, people can behave in a way that is consistent with being in a mental state, but not actually be in that state. For example, an actor can pretend to be in pain, but not actually be in pain. In addition, people can have a mental state, but behave as if they do not, like someone who can ignore pain. Behaviorism also can't account for what mental states are like, Mental states have a certain kind of quality, a certain kind of feeling. There is something it is like to have them. Philosophers call these qualia. Saying that mental states are behavioral dispositions doesn't seem to fully appreciate this fact. Lastly, logical behaviorism is predicated upon logical positivism, which was abandoned once it was realized that it was self-refuting. It suggested, that which is meaningful and true is only that which can be verified. But there's no way to verify that. So logical positivism is false and meaningless by its own lights. But the failure of logical behaviorism did not make philosophers retreat back to the soul hypothesis. The desire to find the mind in the world was still very prevalent. As we continued to learn more about the brain, we realized that the reason that we have the behavioral dispositions that we do is because of our brain states. Our behavior is caused quite literally by events in our brain. And so a new theory emerged that held our mind states to be identical to our brain states. It was called identity theory. D.M. Armstrong explains the move from behaviorism to identity theory using an analogy. Consider the brittleness of glass. One way to describe or account for the brittleness of glass is to say, it has the disposition to break easily when struck lightly. But while this is true, it does not seem to be the whole story. The reason that it shatters easily when struck lightly is because it has a certain kind of physical structure. Thanks to science, we now know what that physical structure is. Glass is brittle because it does not have good large area orderly crystalline structure. So now we can say that something is brittle because it has that kind of physical structure. 
In fact, we can identify the brittleness of glass with the kind of physical structure that it has. To be brittle just is to lack a good large area orderly crystalline structure. In the same way, we have learned that our behavioral dispositions are caused by our brain structure. To be disposed to behave a certain way just is to have a certain kind of brain structure, for our neurons to be configured and firing in a certain kind of way. Since behaviorists identified our mental events as behavioral dispositions, and we came to learn that behavioral dispositions were a certain kind of brain event, it was quite natural to, in turn, claim that certain types of mental events are identical to certain types of brain events. But to fully understand what this theory amounts to, a couple words of clarification are in order. First of all, when an identity theorist says that mind and brain are identical, they are using the term identical in the most literal sense possible. Think again about Clark Kent and Superman. Lois Lane thinks they are different people. She's mistaken, but that's what she thinks. In reality, of course, Clark Kent is Superman. They are one in the same person. Superman is Clark Kent in a cape. Clark Kent is Superman in a suit and glasses. They are one in the same person. Philosophers call this numerical identity. Identity theorists suggest that minds are numerically identical to brains. The first identity theory was called type identity theory. It suggested that every type of mental event was identical to a certain type of brain event. So, for example, if there is a certain kind of neural fiber that fires in brains every time someone is in pain, for a long time they were called C-fibers, then pain just is C-fiber firings. That type of mental event is identical to that type of brain event. Type identity theory has quite a few advantages. It coheres very nicely with what we know about how the brain works. The reason that specific mental events and functions go away when someone's brain is damaged is because the brain is identical to its mental functions. Naturally, when the brain is damaged, the mind is damaged. It also avoids any problems of downwards causation and, if true, completely solves the hard problem of consciousness. If mental events are numerically identical to brain events, we need not explain how one can causally affect the other. How does your mental event of being in pain cause your hand to jerk away from the hot stove? There is no need to account for that any more than there is a need to account for how Superman flying out a window also makes Clark Kent fly out a window. If they are one and the same thing, the relationship between them needs no explanation. The hard problem of consciousness is also dissolved. We need not explain how mental events emerge from brain events if indeed they are numerically identical. Type identity theory ran into a problem, though, when we started thinking beyond ourselves. It is likely that there are intelligent species elsewhere in the universe. It's doubtful that they will ever visit our planet before we go extinct. It's even more doubtful that they have already visited our planet, but the universe is a really big place. It's likely that life has evolved somewhere else in the universe. But there is no reason to think that this alien life is biologically like us. They may not even have brains. And if they do, there is no reason to think that their brains will be the same type of organ that we have. But if they behave like us, for example, if they shriek and pull themselves away from red-hot surfaces, it would seem obvious that they are in pain. Yet, such creatures would not have the same type of brain events that we do. For example, they may not even have C-fibers in their brains. Since type identity says that certain types of mental events are identical to certain types of brain events, since those aliens don't have the type of brain events that we do, they couldn't have the type of mental events that we do. They couldn't be in pain. But this seems clearly wrong. If the alien shrieks and jerks away from a hot surface, obviously it's in pain. So this seems to be a shortcoming of type identity theory. The way philosophers express this shortcoming is this. Type identity theory doesn't seem to account for multiple realizability. It seems that pain is multiply realizable. Many different types of things can be in pain, and pain can be produced by different kinds of systems. So if identity theory is going to survive, it needs to allow for multiple realizability. It is for this reason that token identity theory was developed. 
A token is a particular instance of a kind of thing. A pencil is a kind of thing, but the pencil in your hand is a token, a particular instance of that kind of thing. Token identity theory suggests that particular instances of mental events are identical to particular instances of brain events. So your particular mental events are identical to particular events in your skull. But that doesn't mean that anything that is having the same type of mental events that you are has to have the same type of brain you do. An alien could also possess that same type of mental event even though it doesn't have a brain anything like yours. Its mental event would be identical to whatever physical structure in it was producing that mental event and its corresponding behavior. In this way, token identity theory allows for multiple realizability and yet is able to maintain that brain events are identical to mental events. Both logical behaviorism and identity theory are classified as materialist theories because they suggest that the mind can be found in the material world. The most convincing argument for materialism, at least in my eyes, is given by David Popenow in his appropriately named paper, The Case for Materialism. Since we've already seen the shortcomings of logical behaviorism, let me modify it slightly into an argument specifically for identity theory. The argument goes like this. It seems obvious and intuitive that mental events have physical causes. My having a headache is what makes me reach for the aspirin. My being hungry for sweet potato fries is what makes me go to Johnny Rockets. I love their sweet potato fries. Our minds, we might say, have causal efficacy. They cause things to happen in the world. Specifically, they cause our bodies to move in certain kinds of ways. But it seems equally obvious and intuitive that all physical effects in the world that have a cause are caused by purely physical prior histories. We saw this before when we talked about the soul hypothesis and the causal closure of the physical world. We are even more certain that the movement and actions of human bodies are produced by activity and events in the brains that inhabit those bodies. This is why brain damage or malfunction can cause or hinder our behavior and why we can see activity in a person's brain as or even before they make decisions to move their bodies. We'll talk more about such research when we talk about free will. In short, we know that the physical movements of our body are caused by physical events in our brain. The fact that my body gets up and goes to Johnny Rockets is causally explained by physical events that happen in my brain. For simplicity, let's just say that sweet potato craving chemicals are released. Lastly, it seems equally obvious and intuitive that the physical actions that our bodies take are not overdetermined. They don't have two separate, sufficient, distinct causes. For example, it wouldn't make sense to think that both my hunger for sweet potato fries and that sweet potato craving chemicals in my skull are sufficient causes for my visit to Johnny Rockets. If that were true, that would mean once the craving chemicals were released, even if my mental event of being hungry for sweet potato fries didn't exist, if I wasn't hungry for sweet potato fries at all, I would still get up and go to Johnny Rockets to order sweet potato fries, presumably wondering the entire time why I was going to Johnny Rockets. If that were true, that would mean that I could still go to Johnny Rockets to order sweet potato fries, even if my brain wasn't releasing the sweet potato craving chemicals. No. If the mental event or the brain event is missing, the action doesn't occur. What follows logically from these three seemingly obvious intuitive facts is that brain events are identical to mental events. Why? Well, think of it this way. If Lois Lane knows that Superman defeated Lex Luthor, but also comes to realize that Clark Kent defeated Lex Luthor, but also realizes that Lex Luthor was not stopped by two distinct persons, what must follow is that Clark Kent is identical to Superman. If M causes A, but B also causes A, and A can't have two distinct causes, then it must be that M just is A. If our mental events cause our bodily actions, but our brain events also cause our bodily actions, and our bodily actions can't have two distinct sufficient causes, then our mental events must be identical to our brain events. This argument is valid. The conclusion follows from the premises. So to deny its conclusion, one must deny one of its premises. And this is not going to be easy given how intuitive each one of the premises are. If we deny the first premise, that the mental has causal efficacy, we would essentially be suggesting that the fact that I am hungry for sweet potato fries 
has nothing to do with the fact that I get up and go to Johnny Rockets and order sweet potato fries. The fact that I have a headache is not the reason I get some aspirin. Mental states are just causal danglers. There actually is a theory that suggests this. It's called epiphenomenalism, and we'll talk about it later. But many philosophers find it unintuitive and thus are not willing to reject this premise. To deny the second premise seems equally problematic. We have about 150 years of evidence for the causal closure of the physical, and even more convincing evidence that our bodily actions are caused by neuronal happenings in our brains. To deny this premise would require rejecting a large portion of scientific knowledge. To reject the third premise, that our bodily events can be causally overdetermined, is to accept what philosophers call the belt and braces view, or for those of us who aren't English, the belt and suspenders view. Someone who wears both a belt and suspenders is making doubly sure that their pants stay up. But of course, if either the belt or suspenders were missing, their pants would still stay up. Someone who thinks that our bodily actions are caused by both mental and physical events thinks our bodily actions are doubly assured, but is also committed to thinking that if either one of those things were missing, either the mental events or the brain events, that the bodily event would still occur. And as we noted before, this seems quite odd. Of course, one might maintain that the mental always accompanies the physical, that is, that the mental always accompanies the brain events in question, but if they really are separate distinct happenings, it's unclear why this would be the case. Such a mechanism would be unique in the physical world, and such a theory would not be simple. But despite the persuasiveness of this argument, identity theory still faces some major objections and questions. The most significant objection is what I will call the qualia problem. To understand the problem, one must first understand a basic rule in philosophy, the indiscernibility of identicals. The basic idea of the rule is this. Suppose we have some object A and some object B, and we are wondering whether or not A and B really are the same object. For example, suppose we notice a bright object in the sky at night and call it the evening star and we notice another bright object in the morning and call it the morning star. We might legitimately wonder if the morning star and the evening star are actually the same object. Are we just seeing the same thing from two different angles at two different times of day? If the answer is yes, then it must be that the morning star and the evening star have all of the same properties. They can't be at different locations at the same time. One can't be hot while the other one is cold. For any given property that one has, the other must have it. Certainly, if I can identify a property that the morning star has but the evening star can't have, or vice versa, it would be clear that they are distinct objects. As I mentioned last lecture, the morning star and the evening star are the same object. They're both the planet Venus. But this means that the morning star and the evening star share all the same properties. The evening star is out in the morning. We just call it something different at that time. So, if brain events and mental events are numerically identical, if they are one and the same thing, then they must share all the same properties. One can't have a property that the other lacks, and it certainly can't be the case that one possesses a property that the other can't have. Yet, this is exactly what seems to be the case. For example, think about something that you believe. Pick anything. Got it in your head? Okay, now, ask yourself, where is that belief located? I'm not asking about the brain event that produces the belief. I'm asking about the belief itself. Does your belief have a location? Of course not. Location is not a property that mental events like a belief can have. Or what about your desires? Your love for your significant other? Do those have locations? It seems not. Yet every brain event does have a location. It occurs in a very specific spot inside your skull. So brain events have a property that many mental events lack, location. We could say the same thing about other properties that brain events seem to have that mental events lack, like mass. Thus it seems that brain events and mental events cannot be numerically identical. The opposite is true as well. Think about what being hungry feels like. There is, of course, a physical fact about how empty your stomach is, but there is also an experience that accompanies that fact. And there is a certain kind of quality to that experience. That experience has a certain kind of property. 
We call, philosophers call it qualia. Now again, ask yourself, do any brain events have that property? Does a neural firing pattern feel like being hungry? Or consider a better example. Think about color, or more specifically, the property of color that your visual experience has. Think about looking at an apple and what that experience is like. Now, think about what happens in the world when you see an apple. Frequencies of light are emitted from the sun or a light bulb that hits the apple. In high frequency light, waves are close together, and in low frequency light, the waves are further apart. The apple, due to the molecular structure of its skin, absorbs most frequencies of light, but reflects a certain frequency of light. When that frequency of light hits your eyeball, exposing the photoreceptors in your eye to a certain number of waves per second, your optic nerve sends a signal to your brain. Your brain's neurons fire in a certain kind of way, send signals along a couple of pathways, and eventually, poof, a red experience emerges. Now ask yourself, where is the red in that scenario? Can you find any redness in the physical world? The wavelengths aren't red, they're just waves, spread out or pushed together in different ways. That frequency of light is not a color, it's just a collection of waves. The molecular structure of the apple is not red, it's just physically configured in a way that it absorbs certain frequencies of light and rejects others. The photoreceptors in the back of your eye aren't red, the electrical signal sent along your optic nerve is not red, and none of your neurons are red. And the configuration or activity of your neurons is not red. The only thing that is red is your visual experience. The property of redness is something that is had only by mental phenomena. No brain event is red. Mental events have properties that all brain events lack, and so it seems that mental events cannot be identical to brain events. This is a pretty serious problem for identity theory, and as far as I know, no satisfactory solution to it has ever been offered. But there's another question that has to be answered by identity theorists that I want to consider because it will lead us into a discussion of some very significant issues in the philosophy of mind that will also lead us into considering other theories of mind. The problem is this. Token identity theory suggests that particular tokens of mental events are identical to particular tokens of brain events, and it leaves open the possibility of the same type of brain events being identical to other types of brain events, like alien brain events. But one wonders, what are the criteria for identity? What does it take for a mental event to be identical to a brain event? Consciousness does not accompany all brain events. In fact, most of what the brain does is unconscious. So in virtue of what is a mental event identical to a brain event? And how could we tell what mental events a brain event is identical to? Although there is not one single answer to this question, there is a very popular answer. That's probably the most popular answer, and that is functionalism. And it is to functionalism that we will turn in the next lecture. But before we do, let's review what we've learned in this lecture. We've been exploring the nature of the mind and the hard problem of consciousness, which are both fundamental issues within the study of metaphysics, which is concerned about the nature of all reality, including the mind. The inadequacy of the soul hypothesis made philosophers seek the mind in the material world. The first suggestion, logical behaviorism, fell short but eventually led to identity theory the notion that mental events are identical to particular brain events. The first version of that theory, token identity theory, didn't allow for multiple realizability. That is, it didn't allow for the possibility of beings without brains like ours to be in mental states like ours. Token identity, which suggests that particular instances of mental events are identical to particular instances of brain events, was developed to avoid this objection. Identity theory seems right because it seems obviously true that A, mental events cause bodily movements, B, brain events cause bodily movements, and C, bodily movements don't have two distinct causes. But it also seems to be identity theory can't be true because mental events and brain events each have properties that the other lacks. And two things can't be identical if they don't share all the same properties. But a favorite theory of identity theorists for what makes a mental event identical to a brain event is functionalism, 